Greetings fellow humans and welcome back to yet another wrap up. Simultaneous Times Anthology Volume 2. This is a companion anthology to the science fiction podcast Simultaneous Times. Some of the stories in this anthology have appeared on the podcast, but there's also some new stories as well. I was so impressed with this anthology. I think I had really realistic expectations for this, and overall they were met, if not slightly exceeded. It's a wonderful mix of the various takes on the genre of sci-fi. I always love an illustrated book, but while I was initially skeptical of the use of five different illustrators, seeing it come together in the final product, it only made sense that there are different art styles to suit the different authors and tones of the stories. The order the stories are compiled in has this certain sort of flow to it, like a well-mixed mixtape. It makes sense rather than jumping from one extreme to another. I enjoyed revisiting the stories I had already heard on the podcast as I picked up on some of the finer details I had missed the first time. The sentence, who didn't have cancer now? From Susan Rukeyser's From the Angels to Snakes offers a minute but poignant detail in her dystopian world. And while reading John Christopher's parody of sci-fi adventure pulp, Jim Darren and the Return of the Skylords of Venus, I could visualize some of the fun sound production that ended up in the audio version. Like when time slows down, so does the reading and the music. I was also really stoked to revisit Through the Raven's Eye by Gabriel Hart, as that was the first episode I had ever listened to. Whenever I read anthologies, I always expect to have a few stories that really stand out to me and others that I didn't like as much. That sort of division wasn't the case with this book. I tried to decide which story was my favorite, but I liked and engaged with each of them about the same. But I think The Activator by Anastasia Wasco is going to be the one story that won't leave my brain. The story is really dense with a lot going on and intrigue and world building, as well as written very stylistically. It's a story that I think different things will stand out to me each time I read it, as well as one I won't be able to stop thinking about. It's something I really enjoyed as a longtime listener but also a great introduction to the podcast and the sort of content you can expect to see month to month. Or I guess, listen to? (laughs) With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a contemporary young adult book. Main character Amani is in her senior year of high school. She has always been gifted with a talent for cooking, but the opportunity to attend culinary school has always seemed like an unrealistic dream, as she is a teenage mom living with her abuela and working a fast food job to make ends meet. That is, until her school offers a special culinary class, with a grand trip to Spain included at the end of the year. Amani is cautious to take advantage of this opportunity, just as she is cautious of allowing herself to get close to a new student, a charming boy by the name of Malachi. Chapters were short and snappy, and overall the writing style is more like a poetic prose. It made for a really quick read that kept my attention throughout. The book is divided into three sections, and each section begins with a recipe, which I thought was a cute touch, though I would have liked to have seen more than just three recipes. It was just infrequent enough that I kind of forget about it entirely until the next one. I like the perspective we are given with Imani, especially as a teenage mom. I'm so used to seeing the narrative center around an unplanned pregnancy, and usually once the baby is born, it's put into adoption, and the teenager returns to normal life as if it never happened. Which I'm not saying I have anything against that. People need to make the right choice for themselves, but it's not the only experience, and so I kind of liked seeing instead three years after she had the baby and decided to keep her and raise her. Amani is treated differently by her peers sometimes because of it, as well as by strangers. But overall, most of the drama centers around balance in school, work, and spending time with her daughter. There's no question about whether or not Amani loves her daughter or if she plays an active role in raising her, but Amani is also still a kid herself. Her character teeters on this balance between being a responsible and hardworking parent, but also sometimes needing to be the one who's taken care of. It perfectly mirrors this transitional stage in her life where she needs to start making long-term goals for her future. 
I thought Malachi's introduction was a little stereotypical. I've had kids transfer in partially through the school year, but I've never had one of those moments where they're singled out by the teacher and asked to introduce themselves. But overall, I enjoyed the blossom and romance between Malachi and Amani. He's really patient and considerate with her. Amani is initially reluctant because her last relationship was with her baby daddy and things didn't end super well. And bad relationship aside, she's busy enough without having to add a relationship into the mix. And dating someone while being the parent is sort of a whole new game. And I like that her being a mom was never a point of drama in their relationship. I like being able to believe characters are actually attracted to each other, and sometimes when there is just way too much drama like that, I find it hard to believe these people are compatible at all. Not an issue with this book though. I like how the character of Wella is handled. This is a woman who not only raised Amani's father, but Amani herself when her mother died and her father couldn't handle raising her on his own, and she's had to help raise Amani's child as well. The book takes time to actually empathize with how much that sucks for her to be routinely thrown into her caretaker role, despite loving the family she has taken care of. I like that she gets her own plot about taking time for herself and still being able to live her life because it's what she deserves and just because she's an elder doesn't mean it's too late for her to reclaim time for herself or engage in youthful behavior. However, once the book reached its climax, it felt like all other conflicts Aiden in the progression of the book just fizzled out. A girl who's interested in Malachi and therefore jealous towards Amani, and they so happen to be stuck as roommates on the trip to Spain. Her baby daddy is jealous and controlling over her spending time with Malachi, and her baby daddy's mother doesn't seem to like Amani at all or the way she raises her child. All of it conveniently resolves at the end without any clear indication of why these people suddenly stop being awful towards Amani. I actually kind of got bored the last 20 pages. I'm not sure if I was just getting burnout or if the author's sudden lack of interest seeped into the writing. Uglies by Scott Westerfield I feel so late to the game on this book. I vividly remember seeing this book everywhere when I was in elementary school. It was just really popular when it came out, but didn't interest me too much back then. Probably because I had a weird thing about never reading book synopsis at that age. Like if the cover and the book title didn't tell me enough information to get me interested in the book, I wouldn't read it. And I remember assuming that this book would be some sort of teen drama, popular girls and social cliques, so I never touched it. I've known for a while that's not actually what this book is about, but it wasn't until I asked my girlfriend what her favorite books were growing up and that she mentioned this series that I decided I finally wanted to read it. This is a young adult dystopian science fiction. In this future, all war and conflict has been ended with the solution that that everyone at age 16 gets plastic surgery to be equally as beautiful. Main character Tally is eagerly awaiting her 16th birthday when she meets and befriends Shay, a girl who isn't so sure she wants the surgery. When Shay runs away before her birthday, a secret organization in charge of keeping the city in order called Special Circumstances gives Tally the task to find her and the group of resistors she ran away to threatening to withhold giving Tally the surgery to become beautiful if she doesn't do so. I found the initial concept really interesting, and for a Knots book, oddly relevant. It just seems anytime I read a book from the Knots, it always comes across as weirdly outdated, despite only coming out 20-ish years ago. During Tally's life in Uglyville, as it's called, many aspects of the society further perpetrate that pre-operation, people are ugly and will never find happiness until they have the operation. Between habitually referring to other uglies by demeaning nicknames that point out a person's most distinctive flaw, to video games in which people can alter their physical appearance to imagine how much better they will look post-operation, it's no wonder everyone has bought into these ideas. And it reminds me of some aspects of life now that didn't exist back when this book came out. 
Snapchat filters that make your nose a little smaller and your skin clear. I remember seeing a filter on there once sponsored by Crest or some other toothpaste company that would whiten your teeth as if it wasn't just creating the problem and then offering you a product to fix it with. Also various trends on TikTok that would be use a filter in some way to test if you're ugly or attractive. Like the mirror one, for example, it flip your face and watching that, it becomes really apparent how asymmetrical our faces are. And people would straight up cry doing that challenge. I was almost discouraged though while reading this book by how simplistic the writing is in the beginning, as well as how childish character motivations felt. This was definitely something intentional on the author's part to reflect Tally as a character and how shallow her world and life was back in Uglyville. As the story progresses and Tally leaves Uglyville behind, her motivations become more solid and mature, showing her growth from childhood into adulthood within the book. Her progression from a very impressionable child who wants nothing else but to do exactly what society tells her she should want, naturally and believably shifts into her carving out her own identity while living with the rebels outside of society. Even though part of this transformation happens because of a blooming relationship with a boy, I think because the focus was less on a boy telling her as a pre-operation ugly that she is beautiful and more about her own feelings towards him, she discovers that she finds him attractive despite never having the operation and that questions everything she thought she believed in up until this point. I will say I noticed a lot of use of gender neutral language when discussing things like romantic partners. The phrase special someone is used a lot and while there are no same sex couples in this book, I do appreciate that it leaves room for the possibility that this world isn't heteronormative and no one assumes just because you are one gender means you are naturally attractive to the opposite gender. I might be reading into it too much, but I think that was a wonderfully forward inclusion for a YA book that came out in 2005. However, I'm not sure I like that Taylor's parents are included in this book at all. They play a very minor and irrelevant role in Taylor's life, and this is more of a flaw in the world building to me. Children live with their parents when they are young and cute, but once they reach puberty, they are then sent to live in dorms in Uglyville where they are mostly regulated by computers, but are also allowed to visit their parents on occasion. This doesn't sit perfectly right with me. I kind I kind of wish there was a greater division between uglies and their parents where they aren't allowed to see them at all until they get the surgery. I even wish the family dynamic was completely non-existent. Children are separated from their biological parents shortly after birth and then raised entirely by machines so they don't have that concept of unconditional love, further perpetrating the idea that love and happiness doesn't happen to anyone pre-surgery. The book mentions that procreation is something that's highly regulated for population control, which suggests couples are told when they are allowed to have a child. I think it also would have been neat if certain couples or people were specifically chosen to procreate based on how naturally attractive they were before surgery in order to create children with a higher chance of natural beauty. Though also that's getting into eugenics, which I can respect is maybe not something the author wanted to touch at all. As I am writing this script, I am halfway through the second book in this series and so far Taylor's parents haven't been mentioned at all, which just further shows to me that they didn't really play any important role in Taylor's life. Their inclusion felt oddly normal and the only reason I can think of why they were included is to juxtapose Taylor's experience with parents with David, a boy who was born and raised entirely outside of society. But even then, I think it would have been a greater contrast if Taylor just had no concept of all of parents besides being the people who created her and was almost weirded out that David was raised by them. But I did enjoy how this book concludes. When it comes to series, I always like it when the book can wrap up its own plot but also leaves this open window that suggests what the next book will be about. It ends on a really strong motivation for the sequel and obviously I'm already reading it but I won't be talking about it until next month's wrap up. Overall, I was really impressed with this book. 
Psalm for the Wild Builds by Becky Chambers. This is a solar punk science fiction novella and the first solar punk I've ever read, taking place on the moon Panga hundreds of years after factory robots spontaneously gained self-awareness and decided they wanted to be left alone by humanity and live in the wild. Humanity is inspired by this event to reevaluate their overconsumption ways and make change. Now half a panga is left alone to the wild, while the other half belongs to a new type of human civilization that values renewable resources but above all else. The story follows sibling Dex, a non-binary tea monk whose vocation is to travel between towns and offer a comforting listening ear and a steaming cup of tea to those who need a break. However, sibling Dex is at unease with their life and heads into the wild to find purpose. Instead, they find Mosscap, a wild-built robot and the first interaction between humans and robots in over a century. This read is highly philosophical, though also comforting at times. Taking place mostly in the wild offers a break from the usual urban-heavy sci-fi settings I'm used to reading. This future is near utopian. Issues we face today, such as environmental destruction, overuse of resources, massive amounts of waste, are resolved in this future. Seeing the revolutionary solutions having succeeded is somewhat reassuring, yet also scary knowing that the people who really need to change their ways in order to have a sustainable future probably aren't going to. With major problems like these already solved, the question instead asked is, what problems do exist in a near-perfect society? The book explores the self-dissatisfaction of sibling Dex, further perpetrated by them knowing they live a comfortable life. I read sibling Dex to be a character who suffers from anxiety or depression, or both, as a lot of their mental state was relatable to me as someone who has both. I love the idea of robots living in the wild, how casual Mosscap is about allowing bugs to crawl inside its machinery, its admiration towards wildlife, and its hesitance to cause harm to plants. I am always a sucker for robot characters though, and Chambers' book, A Closed and Common Orbit, has one of my favorite depictions of an android character in the genre of sci-fi. However, Mosscap differs greatly from Cedra in the aforementioned title. For one, the use of the pronoun it is something that always made me uncomfortable when referring to AI characters. It, to me, has always inferred object rather than person, and I find it to be dehumanizing. Mosscap intentionally uses the pronoun it in reference to its lack of gender, but it's also proud to be an object. In the conversation with Sibling Dex, Mosscap points out that Sibling Dex is an animal, but they are also more than that, similar to how Mosscap is an object, while still being an individual. I like that contrast, particularly considering that Sibling Dex lives apart from other animals but surrounded by objects, while Mosscap lives surrounded by animals but apart from other objects. They both come from these completely different worlds. I like that Mosscap is bad at math and gets easily distracted, which goes against common stereotypes of robot characters, that they are essentially walking calculators, as well as the culture around Mosscap's species of robots. How robots spend most of their time just admiring nature, serving no greater purpose other than to just exist. The religion in the book is one that is completely fabricated. Before I got my hands on the copy of this book, I attended a virtual reading with Becky Chambers, where she spent a good portion discussing the religion of this world, and while that is an important aspect, aspect of the world building in the story, I was also surprised upon reading it how few and far in between religion was mentioned. The only reason I state this is because I'm not sure if my understanding of their religion comes from having attended this talk, and if it would be confusing to someone who hadn't had that experience, since, since actual developments in the story felt light. However, the concept of a god of small pleasures was both unique and something I really enjoyed. So much religion focuses on self-sacrifice and suffering, and frames pleasure as a sin, when in reality everyone needs a break, and people work and function better when they are also taking time to take care of themselves. 
It really should be a part of religion. And I like how shrines dedicated to this god are really homey with good food and comfortable furniture to rest on. They sound like places I genuinely would want to visit and spend lots of time in, which contrasts my own experiences with churches growing up that were always uncomfortable and cold. This book is the first of a series of novellas and I'm eager to read on. I rated every single one of these books 5 stars on Goodreads, despite having some critique for some of them. Overall, I found all these books to be highly enjoyable, and any critique comes from me just fully engaging with the writing and storytelling. As per usual, if any of these titles interest you, I encourage you to instead shop indie through my affiliate link below. Since Simultaneous Times Anthology is a publication of Space Cowboy Books, a brick-and-mortar independent bookstore, I'm including their link as well for the book. Also, a science fiction short stories sounds like a fun concept for a podcast. You can listen to Simultaneous Times podcast for free anywhere podcasts can be found, and why not? You literally have nothing to lose, only something to gain. Also, link below. <laughs> hard for me not to laugh when you say like when you're talking about like you actually like when the characters are attracted to each other yeah i have to like be quiet for you <laughs> thank you and just like audience laughter